Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for coming today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. For me in Perth, that is the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, this is the second of a series of webinars that reprise some of the best sessions and discussions from the Australian E-Research Skilled Workforce Summit that took place in late July. Um, today, the focus will be on the humanities, arts and social sciences. Sorry. So um, we have four speakers today. Um, the first presentation will be um, about a general discussion on HASS research capability. Then we'll be hearing from um, University of Queensland to learn about the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory. Then Alexis Tyndall from the ARDC will give an update on the HASS RDC project. Uh, and then we'll be opening up for questions at the very end. So first off, I would like to introduce uh, Marco Farmi. Uh, Marco Farmi is the Manager Digital Humanities and Social Sciences at the Research Computing Centre at the University of Queensland. Over to you, Marco. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Matthias. Um, as Matthias said, I manage the Digital Humanities and Social Sciences program at the University of Queensland. I'm also managing the HASS Virtual Lab, so the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences Data and HASS Virtual Lab that is funded by ARDC. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I was involved in a, an interest group that was organized as part of the ARDC Skills Summit. And I thought today I'll give you a, a bit of an account of what happened. And towards the end, I'll, I'll give you some reflections or maybe provocations on, on some of the uh, issues that we discussed, we encountered at the summit, but also things that we've been talking about more generally over the last few months, my, myself, as well as uh, Tyne Dale Sumner, who is my colleague from the Haas Virtual Lab, uh, Sarah King and Ingrid Mason, both from Arnet. Uh, so the event was actually organized and led by, by Ingrid and, and, and Sarah. Tyne and I were involved in there, and we opened the event with a number of uh, um, uh, questions asking the audience what they think. So I'm sharing with you here some, some of the slides of the results we got. And I'm not going to go through them, but I'll give you a few moments for each slide to look at some of the questions that we asked and some of the answers that the community or the group that uh, were at the meeting contributed to. So first we were asking about some of the training that is different uh, about HASS and why HASS could be treated differently from STEM. And this is a question I'll, I'll come back to towards the end there. So these are some of the answers that people have volunteered for us. Then we moved on to another question. Uh, uh, here's more answers, actually. Uh, there you go. Lots of uh, different answers and lots of perspectives. Um, here's even more. And whether there is a real distinction or not, which is an interesting question too. Uh, then we moved on. We, we we're getting hot here. Uh, this is a theme that we adopted for the interest group. Actually, Sarah shared with us these uh, graphics. A lot of them are animated gifs, which you won't get to see today. They're just static today, but they were a lot of fun. So here's another question, which is: Is there a difference between digital scholarship and digital humanities? Uh, is there a difference and what would the difference be? So these are some of the answers there. Um, and then we asked another question and this one is about barriers. So what kind of barriers do people encounter when were they offering training support? And that's a question that was in my mind. Are we talking about uh, people who are receiving the support or people who are delivering the support? Are there, are there, are these questions and issues related to people receiving or the people delivering? Uh, people have different perspectives on that. So these are some answers people shared with us. All right, next question there is imposter syndrome. And this is a question that had arisen several times. It arose at the Skills Summit. It arose last week when we organized another session at the e-research conference around HAS support and whether uh, this is something that we need to address and how we would be able to address. Okay, here's another question. Uh, 
what would be the most outrageous question you would need to ask? And these are some of the questions people posed there. Uh, so a few answers there. And then uh, this one is an open-ended one. We had a discussion about things you don't like about your job. And then finally this one, which, which is uh, interesting. So the story behind this uh, slide is that uh, a few months ago, Sarah King came up to Brisbane and she delivered a training workshop at Griffith University and other conferences. And she told me one of the issues that she encounters is that every time she organizing, organizes a training session, the wrong kind of people show up. So she might be offering an introductory session and the people who are showing up are very skilled and they find it a bit of a waste of time for them. Or conversely, it might be a session that requires a certain background and using uh, technology and the people showing up were really lost and they couldn't keep up. And I suggested to her maybe every time she advertises a training session, she could put in a spice index next to it. So mild is for people who who would need an introduction and then medium to hot and spicy and spicy with people with advanced skills. So, so that's where this theme came up uh, is, is should we have some gradation there? So I'm going to, I'm going to stop uh, sharing the application, get back to me and uh, just go back to some of the provocations and some of the issues that came up from that session. So the first thing that comes to mind is, is what is it really about HAS that makes it different from the sciences and STEM in general? And one answer is that HAS is long tail. So it's not one single tool or one single application. It's many applications, many small communities using different approaches. Uh, and each one of them are very different from each other. And this is a really big challenge for people supporting them, as well as how we can offer the right support services and resources to them. Uh, expectations vary a lot between disciplines. Some uh, use quantitative methods, some use qualitative methods. There is also a big distinction, whether real or not, between social sciences on one side and the humanities and arts on the other side. Uh, so we need to understand this nuance and fine grain difference between the disciplines if we're able, if you want to support them appropriately. Uh, the other question is, is what uh, skills are we talking about? So skills to do what? Um, is, I have two answers to that question. One of them is, is uh, we need to think about skills for an individual versus uh, skills for the community or towards the community. So for the Individual, the skills we can talk about are skills related to gathering data, uh, skills about creating new knowledge, or uh, skills about disseminating information using digital tools and digital methods. So which ones of these are we talking about that would be most interesting to the individual researcher? From a community point of view, we might think about skills related to um, the duty of the researcher towards the community. So are we talking about digital skills to ensure reproducibility of research? So that's one area of interest. Another one are digital skills to foster open research, which goes beyond um, reproducibility into things like sharing data and licensing and, and, th and so on. Or are we also talking about open scholarship, which is not just doing research for the research community, but also research that engages other communities outside of research, so non-academic and non-technical communities. What kind of digital skills do we need to, to develop for these? So these are really interesting questions. And another reason why this is really interesting is the nature, the, the, the nature of the change that is happening in the house disciplines. So technology is evolving all the time, but the way the technology is being applied in humanities and social sciences disciplines, it's changing and evolving all the time. The kind of skill sets that humanities researchers have is changing because we have PhD students joining the, the cohort every year, and these people might come in with established digital skills. So there's a lot of interest in this uh, space, not just by, by offering them support services, but being able to keep up with this rapid uh, rate of change and how we deal with that. So when we come back about uh, and talk about the digital skills, we ask ourselves, is this about developing the digital skills for the researchers themselves, or is it about developing the research skills and digital skills of support staff? Um, or is the purpose for the support staff to provide advice 
but to be able to do things. Uh, that's a different kind of support that we're talking about. Uh, in terms of uh, support staff educating versus training the researchers, which ones of these are, are we meant to be doing? Uh, are we meant to, to be modeling behavior or mentoring or none of the above? Um, are we meant to be conversant with uh, digital tools or be, a, be able to be technicians and be involved and know how to use these tools ourselves? So these are some of the issues that had arisen and these are some of the issues that research support staff and the humanities encounter because there are so many tools, so many skills that it's not reasonable to expect that one person be able to support all of these. So what is it exactly that we're able to offer? And how is that distinct from what a specialist can do, a research software engineer, for example? And how is that distinct from what the researcher are meant to be doing themselves? Um, one, one suggestion I had last week to uh, uh, at the Birds of Feather session is that maybe we're talking about support staff that offer shortcuts. So your real role is not to do things, but enable researchers to, to find information quicker, have access to resources that they, they don't have, uh, they were not aware of, or connect them to other people. And that on its own is a very valuable contribution a support service. Moving on from the role of the individuals, um, our, the other role, the other question was, what is the role of the institutions in this? And there are two uh, types of institutions. On one side, there are libraries and e-research support services. On the other hand, there, there are the schools, the departments, and the faculties. Is there a clear division and distinction between those roles? Are they meant to be working more closely? There is there a division of labor there? Um, Libraries, for example, are they meant to be delivering new services? Are they need to? Are they? Uh, do they need to skill up their staff or hire brand new types of staff that are not librarians? Uh, is their role to simply troubleshoot and help people who are stuck when they are carrying out their digital research? Or are they meant to build some kind of relationship and then take those people through all of these stages from uh, coming up with an idea all the way to delivering uh, research outputs? So that my might encourage libraries to think about coming up with uh, a new way to offer these services, uh, re-engineer basically the workflow and how they engage with the researchers. Going back to the schools, what is the role of a school in this relationship? Are they simply clients for e-research support services and for libraries? Uh, there are other issues that uh, that the schools could, could look into, for example, cultural issues related to using digital research. So one of the challenges with humanities and social sciences is that quite often it's quite, departure, uh, quite a departure from traditional methods. Um, it is a different kind of epistemology than the traditional research that happens in the humanities, arts and social sciences. It's quite often collaborative. Uh, so a lot of disciplines in the humanities are not used to collaborative research. It's almost by definition interdisciplinary, uh, which means that you have to trust your partner who, who comes from a different discipline and has different expertise. And also it's not part of the mainstream scholarship. So uh, traditionally people are meant to be producing conference papers, journal articles and books. And now we're talking about creating digital artifacts, not traditional research output, uh, creating things like uh, websites, um, uh, simulations, games, mobile apps, and so on. And how do we value this? And this is where the schools could have a role to recognize some of the, these activities as legit legitimate scholarship, uh, also recognize the output and be able to co-invest in them. So this is really important to be represented as, as a strong voice and say, this kind of uh, way of carrying out research is a legitimate way and we need the right support from the university and from the support services. Uh, another question that arose when we talk about the role of the school versus the scroll of libraries is, is whether there's a division of labor there between generalist skills versus specialist skills. So increasingly there are a number of skills that are needed across all domains. I'm thinking about text analytics, for example, mapping, visualization, and so on. But then there are also other very specialized tools for the discipline. Maybe that's one place where the schools need to take some carriage rather than the library. Uh, are we talking about introductory sessions or something to work with advanced researchers on? Uh, again, what is, what is the role of the library working with advanced researchers or is it simply for introductory material or is it somebody else's job? 
So there are a lot of interesting questions there in terms of the role of the institution, how they can support humanities digital research. But also I think there's another role on a, on a higher level, which is the role of the academies, uh, the role of coal and other consortia about developing a national agenda for skills development for digital research support, uh, about integrating digital tools and methods training into research training, which is not happening just yet. So we want to build that pipeline so that people who get their PhDs are already skilled and digitally ready to carry out digital research rather than starting from scratch. One other issue that we had is, is about people already in academia who need to skill up and they don't have opportunities there to, to do so. So we want to develop pathways for professional development for academics so that they can develop their digital skills. So there are a lot of interesting questions that had arisen I don't think there's one single answer, but I think by working together, there might be opportunities there to come up with some really interesting initiatives that are both for individuals, at the level of the institution, and on the national scale. So that's pretty much it what, and what we talked about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Marco. Lots of uh, interesting questions. Okay, so next up, this, uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Professor Michael Hoare and Dr. Martin Schweinberger. Um, they are both from the School of Languages and Cultures at the University of Queensland. Michael is Professor of Linguistics and Head of School, and Martin is a Postdoc Research Fellow. And they will be discussing their uh, Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory. Over to you. Okay. So, um, uh, as it happens, uh, I think our presentation talk follows um, very nicely um, from the one Marco uh, gave and raising the questions around that balance between general support uh, for digital humanities research and digital methods and humanities and what it is we're doing in the school where we're trying to provide a more specialist um, uh, support. Okay, um, so this, this is just introducing us. Uh, we've already been introduced, I think. Just getting used to Martin's mouth. Um, so uh, I guess starting off, just to give the bigger picture of, of where we see this sitting, um, essentially the world economy is changing and the world's economy is shifting to an environment in which data is really part of the economy and we can start talking about the data economy and if you start looking at some of the big companies um, uh, in the world uh, i'm just showing them here what you find is text analytics lie at the core of some of the biggest companies in the world and i think research and teaching the humanities, there's growing awareness of this, um, but there's a real pressing need uh, for us in the humanities to be upskilling so that we, and in, in, in the research we're doing, we're taking advantage of all these computational opportunities there are, but also that we're passing on these skills to our students as well. So what, what we would agree, I think, here is that there's an enormous potential for bringing in computing into the humanities. There's opportunities around big data, which really, until this point in time, we, we haven't had, but there are now mega, mega corpora, you might mm -hmm. say. And probably the, the best example of this in Australia is Trove, which is um, held by the National Library. Um, the, the Australian Web Archive, which is part of that, there's 20 years of the Australian web. Um, we talk about that, I think it's 600 terabytes or something of that size, but it's, it's really massive. Um, and so that requires uh, both computational infrastructure and also computational skills, which are really new to the vast majority of uh, humanities researchers. There's also the possibility, humanities is possibly a little unique uh, compared to other areas. Um, the data that comes into the square mile uh, uh, astronomy uh, array uh, is really only usable by astronomers. However, humanities data is, is almost infinitely reusable and that, that creates a lot of opportunities but also requires skills, being able to transform those data sets, use them in different ways for different, different purposes as well. And there's really interesting real-world applications as well. 
Um, so given this kind of environment, as, as, as I've said, there's really a, a pressing need for training and education in computational approaches and digital tools in the humanities, make sure that we're keeping pace uh, with other fields of scientific endeavour and also for Australian humanities remain internationally competitive. And also students themselves increasingly demanding these kind of skills in, in the courses they do. Um, when we start looking at it, you can see the picture. Um, it, you know, the reality is there's some real local challenges in dealing with this. There's issues around ensuring best practice and transparency in research that we're, we're providing access and sharing of data. There's, there's real strong movements for the open science uh, movement has, has had a real impact on the way in which linguists are working. Um, and so that, that certainly is movement there. However, there's still arguably some kind of reliance, perhaps over-reliance on existing tools, sometimes they're commercial tools. And what that means is the research process, if you move across to commercial tools, the research process actually becomes more opaque. And that's not really what we're aiming for in, in the open science world. Um, of course, we're dealing with people um, who are used to doing research in certain ways, and some of them, um, are they willing to change? There's different needs across different disciplines, there's different levels of experience and expectations, and also there's just a lack of really sort of specialist material and training. So the approach we've taken here in, in the faculty is to pilot an approach in a particular school and then move to, to sort of spread that out across other schools in the faculty. Um, and the approach we have is a continuum between generic training, uh, which is, as Marco indicated, something that the library can pick up and, and they're providing introductory courses and more general courses. And we work closely with our librarian liaison officer to make sure that we're complementing what they offer. Um, and what we're doing in our school is more specialised training uh, that really fits the needs. And if you're going to get um, staff on board, um, then being able to pick up at the point they are at in terms of their own research programs is really important rather than here's some general stuff you might think about. Um, but in doing this particular research project, what is it that you, you can be doing? Um, so in order to meet that need, um, we've set up our own online virtual lab which also has a person at the moment, it's Martin, who's working really closely with staff and also our PhD students in the school. So I'll let Martin take over here. Right. So um, I'll talk about what we've done and the visions we have for the Language Technology and Data Analysis Lab, LADAL, um, which is essentially a support infrastructure for um, people who are interested in computing and digital aspects of HASS in our school. Um, it specifically targets humanities researchers and it basically is there to enhance and complement existing uh, programs. So it's not entirely new but it basically fills gaps that were there and basically expands on them. Um, and by basically offering these services we hope that we can offer new pathways into new research possibilities. So how to basically look at data a little differently and maybe tease out findings that we um, we're not be able to, to find before. And essentially the LADAL has two components to it. So there's a real physical space that we're in the process of setting up, which is a specialized computing lab for language-based computation and experimental work. So there people can, uh, can be recorded um, during conversations or uh, for example, acoustic analyses uh, can be done there. And then we have uh, something which is still a work in progress, but we have a, a, a test site there, which is an online virtual lab, uh, which is the LADAL website, where we have um, basically tutorials and explanations about methods and stats, which basically guide someone who's interested in that just through how to do stuff in a step-by-step -step, um, uh, fashion. So um, when we look at the services that I offer at the moment, and uh, I hope that I'll um, have more support in the, in the future is basically offer training uh, and workshops about um, computational digital research methods and te uh, technologies. Uh, also to basically provide information and self-guided study materials because basically from my experience I can say a lot of the questions uh, that I get and the issues that researchers here in the school face are kind of similar and we basically create these materials so that we can basically point them to that and they can uh, basically uh, discover 
how to use something uh, by themselves that basically reduces my workload and also is more uh, efficient just in terms of how um, researchers themselves can, can um, skill up. And also I give uh, hands-on practical tutorials and workshops uh, where I introduce digital tools or computational methods for data extraction and processing, how to visualize data or also stats, um, which is very popular in the school. And the idea is basically to teach people how to code without basically um, teaching programming per se, but basically how to use a computer to create graphs and they'll pick up language just like children uh, acquire a language in their first language acquisition. And an additional feature is that, uh, which is very important, that I offer face-to-face -face consultations. So for example, researchers come to me and they have this data set and then they basically just want to figure out, okay, what can I do with it? And what do I have to pay attention to when I, when I gather data, but also analyze, uh, analyze data? Right, um, so the aim that we have with this lab is to basically um, create skills in this school to basically uh, enable researchers to skill up their own research methods to, to develop themselves uh, when it comes to digital tools and data management, but also when it comes to uh, computational methods and very basic program, uh, programming skills. Um, in the end, where I would like to, to take the lab is where we really have, um, where we really enable people to do data extraction, transformation, processing, and analysis in a very um, transparent and replicable way. Uh, and that also allows the researchers to visualize data, including geospatial data, so mapping, but also creating interactive uh, web apps in a very sophisticated, sophisticated way. And as we're in the School of Languages and Cultures, uh, a focus is, of course, um, on natural language pro uh, processing applications, so text analysis and uh, statistical procedures, including also classification and machine learning uh, to a certain extent. Right, here are just some examples from the tutorials that are um, there at the moment, um, which basically focus on different types of computational analyses and how you can visualize data. So just basically, um, to show you the range of things that we offer. So we have network analyses, just violin plots, word clouds, uh, very sophisticated and new statistical procedures. So the box plots there represent a Baruta analysis. The uh, world map that you see uh, is also created by, by some um, apps that we use. And we have conditional inference trees. We have specialized visualizations for liquid data. And also mosaic plots if you have contingency tables and want to visualize them. So basically the idea is to train people in, you know, how can I create these nice graphs and basically um, show my data in new and interesting ways. Right. So just, just to summarize, um, how has our pilot gone? Um, I mentioned this is a pilot that we've, we've launched in our school with a view to seeing how it can be extended across our faculty. Um, I would say it's an, an outstanding success. Um, I can say that for Martin. Um, and, and I think one of the measures of it is really the demand from humanities researchers in our school really exceeds uh, Martin's ability to, to work with them. Um, so we're, we're looking to, to extend the number of positions we have both in the school and across the faculty. Um, and it, it becomes really clear that we need a range of, of roles uh, to fill out in this area, ranging from lecturers, postdocs, through to social and cultural data scientists, through to platform software engineers who are used to working with humanities people. Um, and we see data scientists and the lecturers as people that can play a key mediating role between uh, platform software engineers who obviously have specialist skills and researchers who obviously not going to be familiar with a lot of the terminology that is second hand uh, to people working in this computational area. And a, a lesson is it is possible, um, but we need to work hard to make sure that we're communicating all the time with the library, uh, with the research computing centre, uh, with, with the staff to make sure that we're aligning what we're doing. Um, but I think the future is bright and uh, we're really happy to share what we've, we've, we've discovered here in the school with others uh, around the country. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much for that, Michael and Martin. Uh, now, um, next up, I would like to introduce my colleague. Well, uh, introduce my colleague Alexis Tyndall. Uh, Alexis is a senior research data specialist at the ARDC and is currently spending a lot of her time on the HASS RDC project. Uh, so, Alexis, could you please give us an update on how that's going? Thank you, Matthias. Um, and this is a, going to be a brief presentation because it will be a short update on this project. It isn't strictly speaking a product of the skills summit, which is the goal of the other presentations in today's uh, in today's webinar. Um, but we thought it was a unique opportunity to connect with a group of participants um, and attendees who are interested in humanities, arts and social sciences. Um, and so an opportunity to update on a project that the ARDC is working on um, that is relevant to that community. So thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. Um, as many of you may know, in the 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap, um, the, uh, that, that review of research infrastructure investment, um, which happens periodically, called for further investment in platforms for humanities, arts and social sciences, and also for investment in um, environments for analysis of Indigenous research data as well. Um, that since that 2016 roadmap came out, there's been various toing and froing between the community and government on that. Um, and the government, the Department of Education has been making an effort to, um, to get further input. In 2019, they announced a National Research infrastructure, infrastructure Scoping Study, which is usually a process that precedes research infrastructure investment. Um, and in order to help gather information for that scoping study, they've commissioned a couple of pieces of what we're sort of calling pre-scoping work, um, which will be carried out um, by the Academy of Humanities, the ARDC, and a private group called Dandelo Partners. Um, these are complementary pieces of work, and the Academy of Humanities has just, is just coming to the end of a piece of work looking at um, international exemplars of research infrastructure support for humanities, arts and social sciences researchers. Um, and the ARDC has been charged with looking, investigating the opportunities and uh, the environment in which we might talk about a humanities, arts and social sciences research data commons. Um, just a bit of background information. What is a research data commons? Some people on this webinar will be very familiar with what I'm talking about, but just in case. Um, and also, the Research Data Commons is a term for cluster of activities that is delivered in varying degrees for different disciplines, depending on the needs of those disciplines. From the ARDC's perspective, a digital research data commons brings together data and related resources to enable researchers to conduct and collaborate on world-class data-intensive research, um, as well as enabling access to data and methods of sharing. A commons can include computing resources and analytical tools and working environments, storage, uh, models, methods for sharing, um, for sharing methodologies and other kinds of support. Um, the nature of a HASS research data commons will depend on the priorities and needs of the communities with which ARDC connects over the course of this project. But the ARDC also would like to mention that um, a common solution for this or any community also involves cultural and social solutions as well as technical solutions. So policy, governance, training and skills complement and enable world-class research environments. Um, what are we looking at in this project? According, uh, looking at our project proposal, we're looking at the fact that a HASS Research Data Commons, if we, if, if we take it at the simplest level, in that National Research Infrastructure Roadmap, they talked about platforms for HASS. Um, this is taking a bit of a deeper investigation on that and saying, look, if there was a HASS Research Data Commons, it may not be one solution for the entirety of the HASS community, um, but it may be made up of a developing coherent environment of connected commonses that address the needs of individual research communities or clustered research communities determining on their, determining, uh, depending on their priorities. Part of our project is to identify and group research communities with similar priorities and needs in this area. Um, we're looking at mapping nationally significant HASS relevant data collections, identifying opportunities to leverage and enhance existing initiatives, and identifying gaps in discoverability, accessibility and interoperability for existing data commons like activity. What does this landscape look like? Well, it's we're sometimes mistaken when we say there hasn't been research infrastructure investment in has There has been, but it's dispersed and uncoordinated. And maximising the value of that research infrastructure can be benefited, uh, 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 great benefit can be realised for the community by being a bit more coordinated in their activities. So we're looking at existing investments and you can see a couple of them in this sort of loose 
group of balloons here, ARC projects, LEAF funded projects, the galleries, libraries and archives museum sector, institutional programs um, like Martin and, and Michael's, government data, the work the AIDC has done previously and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a, it's a broad landscape we're talking about. There is a lot of activity in this area already and what we're talking about here is perhaps looking at how we can ensure those efforts are coordinated to ensure the best value for the research communities. Um, how are we consulting on this project? Um, we've got a few avenues of consultation um, that are happening simultaneously. We're reaching out individually to major data platforms in this environment, so has relevant data platforms and providers. Um, we're working with the Academy of Humanities the, and the Academy of Social Sciences and our DJ partners through Arnet and um, the, the, uh, the other DJ partners. Um, we're looking, we're holding a research and consultation at the upcoming Australian Academy of Humanities Symposium that's happening in Brisbane in November. Um, we're looking over the, uh, the FOR codes that are covered in this area and reaching out to researchers within disciplines that we haven't covered through other means. Um, I'm working on a broad reference group. So some of you who are on this webinar, I may have already spoken to about this and others, uh, you may be on my list already of people I'd like to speak to about this. In the, in the second stage of the project, when we're talking about throwing up models and proposal, I'd really like a very broad reference group to offer us critique on that. Um, and it's, uh, these projects are, uh, are not strictly related, but um, as many of you may be aware, in the last six months, the ARDC has um, supported a range of data and services focused discovery activities and is also presently in the process of calling for applications for um, platforms funding. Um, those applications closed on Friday. And the information that has come out of those processes has also been a good pointer to existing activity in the area. And we're also doing individual reaching out to researchers um, in areas that, that aren't covered in those, in those, uh, by those means. Um, the timeline for this project is roughly described here, but it is a little open. Um, we're talking about information gathering for the remainder of 2019. And during the early three months of 2020, looking at developing and consultate, consulting on possible ideas for what a HASS research data commons would look like and the other information we're providing to the Department of Education. We're looking at delivering a, um, a final version of this information around March, but we do have the project officially runs through till the end of financial year. So that gives us an opportunity to review the department's um, in areas of interest the reaction and the community's reaction to the proposals that are being developed and talk about how we can um, continue to be involved in the scoping study work that the Department of Education is talking about. This is a multi-stage process and at this stage this is an information gathering process or, uh, only. Um, after this the Department of Education will conduct their own scoping study and um, it, yeah, it remains to be seen exactly what that looks like but uh, we're pretty optimistic that it might lead to some research infrastructure investment. So what is it starting to look like? Um, this is a very hastily thrown together and um, uh, uh, a map of the kind of things that are emerging or the, the, the landscape that we're looking at. Here down the centre of this diagram, we can see a number of research communities that we're connecting with and that are, that are data users and that have um, particular data needs or relationships with data platforms and providers. We're looking at existing um, data providers in this environment. You can see many of those that you'd be familiar with um, on the right hand side of your screen there. Um, notably, I just point out, you know, I've got a large box there for GLAM, which is, oh, uh, which is um, covering a large number of institutions, but I've also specifically drawn out Trove, um, the Trove Australian Web Archive and State Libraries, Records and Archives projects as well. Um, you remembering my slide with the balloons, the ARC funded projects, the LEAF funded projects, the institutionally supported projects. Each of these data providers um, exist in a different administrative environment and a different funding and sustainability environment. And that's an interesting challenge to overcome there as well. We're also looking at related initiatives that could be leveraged and enhanced as part of those projects. And some of them are uh, pictured there on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, these are projects that are presently funded by the National Collaborative Research and Construction Scheme and others, um, activities by government, activities, um, even the ARDC activities um, and, uh, and other uh, related initiatives that are there. What 
Uh, the other thing I just wanted to briefly go over is what, what sort of issues are emerging? As I know that some of you have seen me talk about the background to project before. Um, look, I'm just going to flag a few things because this is very much an unsorted and unprioritised list of emerging issues right at the moment. Um, but just the things that are coming up are things that may be familiar to many of you who work in this space already, but it's good to have these things documented and described and examined in a way of, of how they might fit into research infrastructure support. So issues that are emerging as we consult with these communities are the longevity, sustainability and access to data that comes out of ARC funded projects, um, whether that can be reused, whether that should be reused, whether um, old data can be accessed again. Um, the challenges of accessing data, the data level when it comes to collections of has data versus metadata level access. Um, the challenges of sharing qualitative data versus quantitative data. Um, the use of consistent metadata in different research communities and um, how confident and competent they are in using metadata, whether the metadata structures that exist are, are relevant, are um, working for them. Um, the need for secure analysis environments for sensitive data. This is something that's happening in various ways across this research landscape and that's worth looking at as part of this project. Um, community access to data about themselves. In many cases, humanities, arts and social sciences research is research about people um, and uh, there are a couple of different applications where it's particularly important to ensure that those people have continuing access to the data that has been collected as part of research about them. Um, the challenges of accessing government data, um, that is administrative data, survey data, sensitive data, and in some cases even the cost of accessing that data as well. Um, another thing that's come up has about, been about um, platforms for sharing um, non-text-based data, so 3D, uh, 3D representations and things like that. These are just a very loose and um, uh, a loose the loose list of, of things that are starting to come out as we talk to these research communities, it needs a lot of digestion, processing and prioritising at this stage. So don't take it uh, as uh, we'll be acting on these things specifically, but it's just to give you an indication of what's coming out of the conversations we're having in this environment. Um, additional perspectives that we have to con consider as part of this project is what is and should be a national responsibility and what should be an institutional responsibility. And we've also been asked to look at criteria to determine significance for HAS data of national significance. So the question that you may be wondering is how can I be involved? There may be something that is leaping out at you that should be a part of this project. And um, there's a few ways. We're holding this consultation at the Academy of Humanities Symposium in Brisbane in the 15th, on the 15th of November. Um, that consultation is invitation only, but it's not exclusive. We are trying to focus on researchers as part of that consultation because there are other opportunities to connect with the research, commun research support community. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm building an emerging reference group um, and I would love more people to, be who, to express interest in being involved in that. I am connecting directly with researchers, groups of researchers or data providers um, and so am able to video conference or meet with people as relevant if there's insight that they need to share. Um, you should watch the upcoming ARDC newsletters and we will have a po project page on the ARDC website soon, as soon as I get uh, some time at my computer to ensure that that's appropriately informed. And I would encourage you to contact me. So I'll just finish by sharing my contact details here. Um, I'm very happy to talk to anybody about this project. I'm also particularly happy if anyone has um, an area that could benefit from this project that they'd like to highlight to me. Great, thank you very much for that, Alexis. Uh, and now we've come to question time, so I'd like to invite all the panellists to turn on their webcams and unmute their microphones. Um, now, we already have uh, one question. How many digital skills should be embedded within core units, considering digital tools such as text analytics, spatial analysis and so on, enable new interpretations due to the nature of computation? Uh, should they start to become digital research methods? Maybe I can have a stab at this one first. Uh, so this is an issue that came up at the University of Queensland, which is what is the baseline uh, skill set, useful skill set that we need to impart to our research students in general? Uh, and it's really hard to say because it varies from one domain to another. Some, some domains have that integrated already as part of the research methods course, courses, while others uh, just let students do whatever they want to do. Uh, one thing we've done at the University of Queensland is we set up a fellowship program called the Graduate Digital Research Fellowship. And the fellowship is for a, uh, read, um, confirmed PhD students to spend a year 
to develop a digital artifact. And in the process, they're going to develop a digital skill related to that. And that digital artifact will feed into their dissertation. The difference is that that fellow will be part of a cohort of other fellows who were chosen to carry out different digital research projects. So each fellow will have its own method. And by those fellows getting together and meeting once a week, then they inform each other of progress and they learn about some of the opportunities and challenges that each method affords. So by the end of the fellowship, not only you would have gained a skill in one particular method, but you become conversant in other methods. Uh, that works really well if we selected the right fellows and the right mix of methods and disciplines. So that's how we, 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 uh, we address the issue by, by having this mixed cohort and then by, by working with them over a whole period of a year rather than introducing one topic over a couple of hours, which won't cover anything. Thank you, Marco. Michael, Martin, did you have anything to add to that? I have ideas, but they might not be that popular. Um, so I love unpopular ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, to me, it would really help if we, if we manage to introduce basic programming skills um, to the young researchers or PhD students um, or even BA students. Uh, because in, instead of basically learning new tools and basically at the end of your PhD, you've used 20 tools or something like that. You learn one programming language and basically then it's very, very easy to adapt to different packages. That's very simple. But I also have to agree with Marco wholeheartedly because I know the fellows and the diversity of projects that they that they do. And so basically for them, it's actually very good to focus on very different things. And to be honest, I wouldn't know how to do many of the things they do in Python or in R. So you still need those very specialized tools to, to get the job done. But ideally, I think um, it would be perfect if, if um, young researchers or students uh, would get or learn a basic understanding of, of very basic programming skills. Yeah? And there it doesn't matter whether it's Python or R or Java, it doesn't matter. So, uh, I think my radical opinion as well, um, since I'm not working in front of the humanities faculty right now, um, I, I would say, yes, it really needs to be embedded at all, all levels. Um, and yes, at the research level, PhD level, we can be really specialised. I mean, when we talk about undergraduate students, yeah, we, we need to really start seriously thinking about that the, uh, the humanities programs, how we embed those in the program. And to introduce computational thinking to the students, because we've seen the data economy, the data economy revolves a lot around text um, and humanities students and images uh, film and so on. Um, so these are things that humanities students are dealing with all the time and the interpretation the complexity of those interpretations. Um, and it, it strikes me that there's really great opportunities for humanities students who have these skills uh, to take things forward in the new economy. So this is a little radical though for, for humanities faculties, I think. Um, so it's a step-by-step -step process. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Now, uh, I suppose actually I have a question, um, slightly personally uh, motivated. So I come from a um, librarianship background, or well, I studied computer science as an undergraduate, and I've spent 15 years as a librarian, but I have practically zero experience in actually undertaking research. Uh, so short of doing an MPhil or a PhD or something like that, uh, how can research support professionals like me gain a deeper understanding of uh, the methods used in some of these disciplines that don't necessarily, uh, well, that we don't have that much experience in? I, I think this is, we're looking for new positions in universities and you see them in, in, in institutes which are larger. Um, so in the medical um, institutes and so on, um, they have what are called research data scientists. Um, and I think research data scientists are in an ideal position to help explain to, to people in the professional roles what it is researchers are doing without getting logged. Because if you go straight to the researcher, they'll give you the trees, right? I mean, you won't get the bigger picture. Um, so they'll help to give you the bigger picture. And also 
help connect in with those researchers. So I think people in those kind of roles, um, and I consider Martin's uh, in, in a research data scientist role. Um, the thing about the research data scientist role is universities haven't figured out, is this an academic position? Is it a professional position? Is it a combination? I think different universities are coming up with different answers to that question. Um, and Martin, I should say for him, he's in an academic role. Um, so his role is academic, but he's like an academic data scientist. You could also have more of a professional data scientist. Um, but I think people in those kinds of roles. And if, if you've got a background like yours, you know, that's, that's a great role to get into. Um, I think you cannot overestimate the importance of being able to communicate between, between different groups because it's really about translation in a way. So um, the mere fact that you know what people mean who come from a computational point of view and to be able to communicate that is, is very important. And we need more people who are in between, who are mitigators, mediators between, between those fields. Because very often uh, when I talk to researchers, they, they don't really know how to translate what they want into a language that would be understood by a computer scientist. And then both sides are frustrated very, very quickly because the computer scientist will end up working uh, endlessly because it's not clear what he's supposed to do or she's supposed to do. And the researcher is not satisfied because um, the researcher doesn't get what he wants, you know. So I think the, the ability to basically translate is, is very important and cannot re, really cannot be overestimated. Okay, great. Now, uh, we yeah. do have a few more questions from the attendees. So, um, so uh, what are some strategies to start introducing digital study to reticent humanities schools? Uh, so if I may take a, a stab at this one. So when I first joined the University of Queensland, I was I was asked to go and support the fact of humanities in the university, and that's about a thousand people between academics, research students, and so on. And the problem was is a lot a lot of people didn't understand what it is to do digital humanities, and whether that's something different from what they're doing or that's something they're already doing. Uh, so the problem the the challenge I set to myself was to educate those people. At the first instance. Once they recognize the value of using digital methods and digital tools, then we can train them. But if you just train people without explaining to them what they're getting trained on, then you're never really going to get any research value out of it. So we set up a number of engagement programs to educate people by showing them examples of other researchers and other universities and other disciplines and how they use digital tools and inspiring them with that and saying, wouldn't you like to do something like this? And that starts a conversation, well, how, how do I get trained? Where do I get the resources? Who are my collaborators? And so on. The other uh, aspect of it is to normalize the practice of digital research in the humanities and social sciences. So one of the uh, issues I encountered when I, uh, is I interviewed uh, a lot of researchers and PhD students, and they told us that they would like to carry out this kind of research, but it is different from the mainstream. It's other. And that is a big challenge because it doesn't get recognized and all of the investment they make in training and skilling themselves up and building digital uh, platforms and tools and so on wasn't really treated as legitimate research. So one activity that we are undertaking is to normalize digital research and accept it as something that people from any discipline could engage in regardless of what the discipline is and what the method is. So we, we had an engagement, public engagement program where every semester we had an event, we showcased examples of technology that is being used or developed at the university and how it's been applied across the humanities and social sciences disciplines. And that's to value and recognize those people working on it, but also for others who don't, to acknowledge its existence and acknowledge that the university accepts that as a legit, legitimate scholarship. So it was both a skilling program in terms of education and training, but also uh, inviting others who don't engage in digital research to accept that kind of practice and make it part of the mainstream. Okay, great. Thanks, Marco. Now we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, there are a couple more questions, but we'll quickly switch track to you, Alexis. Uh, uh, where can we track progress on the commons? Uh, will it be ARDC website focused or social media? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a 
The ARDC website, at the moment, it's difficult to find any information, but largely because I haven't filled out the project template to get the page up on the ARDC website yet. I've been too busy running around talking to the community. Um, yes, we will have a page on the ARDC website. It'll be in the form that we do our project pages on the ARDC website, which is a timeline based form. So a bit of background information and a timeline going down the right hand side. That should give you an indication of where we're up to in that timeline. Any outputs from the project that are able to be made public should be shared in that environment, but I cannot make, I'm not 100% sure what they're going to look like just yet. Um, as we make announcements on our progress through that timeline, the ARDC newsletter is a good place to get that information from. Personally, I'm not a big social media user, um, but you might want to follow the ARDC Twitter, which we use to complement our ARDC newsletter for major announcements of that kind as well. So I think the answer is everywhere, but um, <laughs> uh, ARDC channels would be the best place to get that info. Can I, can I slip in here and just plug in the House Virtual Lab? So we have a suite of uh, tools called the Tinker Suite. We have the Tinker Studio, but also we have social media presence. We have a Facebook page where we post stories about digital tools and research methods being used, but also information about what's going on in Australia. We also have a newsletter that you can sign up to. So visit the website, thinker.edu.au, and you can sign up for the website and uh, for the newsletter. And we're working on pushing a newsletter that is specifically targeted to digital research support staff. And that's coming up very soon. We're working on it at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, now, with one minute to go, there's one last question. So I beg your forbearance. Um, so how have computational tools been disseminated within the humanities? So, so how has that happened until now? In one minute? <laughs> um, by basically um, people leading the way. I mean, I, I come from a corpus linguistic background and um, people were interested in basically, you know, how can we empirically test our ideas about language? And then it came very naturally that people became more interested in statistics. If you just look at how often statistics were mentioned in journal publications, they basically uh, increased exponentially uh, since the 2000s. Yeah. And so it just became more prevalent and people were more interested and they skilled up individually. Um, and now we're, uh, in Corpus Lewis, it's actually quite, quite good in that respect, right? Um, but I think we need to professionalize that not only basically make researchers uh, skill up independently, but really to, to um, be more efficient and set up an infrastructure for that. All right, I muted myself. Uh, we'll probably leave it at there, but I would just like to very quickly share the details of our next, of the last webinar in this series, uh, Digital Skills Training in Ecology and Bioinformatics. That will be taking place on Tuesday, the 19th of November. Uh, and you can sign up for that at the ARDC events page. Uh, other than that, thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you all enjoyed yourself. And I'd like to thank our panelists uh, one last time, Michael, Martin, Marco and Alexis. Uh, and uh, please have a good day.